All right, welcome back to Calculus 2. Um, so today we're just going to do some more review for um, exam three, which is going to be this evening from 8 to 10 p.m. So what we're going to do first is we're going to continue working through the practice exam that we began doing last time. So I think we got through questions uh, one through nine on that. If you, if you missed that, I posted a video on um, YouTube about this. So you can go ahead and look at that. Um, uh, but yeah, we'll just go through the rest of the practice exam here, and then I'll be happy to answer uh, any general questions you guys have um, for the remaining bit of time. All right, so let's see here. Let me pull up my practice exam. All right, so question 10. Okay, so for this one, this is practice exam number 10. Our function is x squared e to the 2x, and our goal is to find the 50th derivative at 0 right here. So that's our goal for this. We want to find the 50th derivative of this function at 0. Now, the thing is, is that we don't manually want to do 50 derivatives, obviously. It's going to take forever to do that. I mean, it's going to take your whole exam at least. Um, so we've got to find a better way of doing this. Now, the way we learned in class to do this is we're going to write a uh, McLaurin series for our function and then use the formula for McLaurin or Taylor coefficients to figure out what the derivative is. So first of all, let's just find the series for this. So we'll start off with the closest McLaurin series for this, which is e to the x, and you'll have this provided to you on your exam. This is the sum from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial right here. All right. And then we want e to the 2x. We need that. So that's going to be the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 2 to the n, x to the n over n factorial. And then I'm finally going to multiply both sides of this uh, by x squared right here. And we have n equals 0 to infinity of 2 to the n, x to the n plus 2, because I multiplied by two more x's here, right? I multiplied by an x squared, so this became x to the n plus 2. And then we divide by n factorial. Are all McLaurin series able to be used as power series centered around zero? Yeah, that's exactly what they are. McLaurin series is just a power series centered at, at zero. So yeah. All right. So let's see here. Now we actually have our series here. So our goal is to get the 50th derivative, right? So remember our formula for our Taylor coefficients. We have a sub m is the mth derivative at zero, or whatever the center is for other functions, divided by m factorial right here. All right. So our goal is to get this, right, just with m equals 50. So we plug 50 in for all of these, and then we multiply up by this factorial. So we're going to have 50 factorial times a sub 50 is our 50th derivative at zero right here. Okay, so that means we're almost there to computing our 50th derivative. We know we're gonna have a 50 factorial in there. We just need to know what a 50 is right here. Now a 50, remember what this signifies. This is where this problem gets a little bit confusing. This is the number next to x to the 50th in our series. So whenever we get to x to the 50th, whatever n makes this be the 50th power, that's the n that we're going to plug in for the rest of this stuff here. And Sam has the right idea here. So what we're going to do is we're going to set this equal to 50 to see what n we're going to use. And then we so we have n plus 2 is 50. We subtract 2. And we have n equals 48 right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug 48 into the coefficient or the number next to our x to a power 
And that will be A sub 50 right here. So A sub 50 will be two to the 48, because our N is 48, over 48 factorial right here. All right, so then all we need to do now is just substitute this into here. So our 50th derivative is going to be 50 factorial times two to the 48 divided by 48 factorial right here. All right, so there we go. There's our 50th derivative. And that did not take nearly as long as doing 50 derivatives manually. And, and on the exam, I know which question we put for this one. I guarantee you'll not be able to do that in many derivatives. So yeah, you definitely need to do it this way. All right, now remember, there's one little catch that can make these problems different here. What happens if we get a number n? So let's say we, we get to this point in the problem where we set this equal to whatever derivative we want and we solve for n. Um, what happens if n is not a whole number? What, what, what was the case? What was the, the situation then? That's right. Your derivative is just automatically going to be zero. And that's because there's no n value. Because remember, this only goes over whole numbers, right? So we're never going to plug in the n value that gives us x to whatever power it is. So when we don't have that x to a power, we assume the coefficient is zero. So this will be zero, and then we get uh, zero right here. When a steps change if the center is not at zero, um, the only difference would be that you would have x minus your center to the end, and then you would just have your center right here. But it would be functionally uh, the same problem right here. All right. Well, if n is not a whole number, n equals zero. It's, if n is not a whole number, then your a sub m is zero. And that makes your derivative be zero. All right. So there we go. So we got that problem. Let's see. Which of the following sets of parametric equations forms a circle? Right here. So this is question 11. Okay, so let's go through each of these and see whether or not uh, these are going to be circles now. So our first option, all right, so which form a circle? Now remember, the, the key ingredient for a circle is that they need to have the same radius in front of a sine and cosine, and one has to have a sine and the other has to have a cosine. That's kind of what we need to have happening uh, for it to be a circle. All right, so let's take a look at the first option here. We have x is sine squared of t plus cosine squared of t, and then y equals t. All right, so what do you think? Do you think this is going to form a circle or not? That's a nose. Yeah, that's right. This is not going to form a circle. And why not? It looks like we have sine squared plus cosine squared. That kind of feels circle-y. But the thing is, is that sine squared plus cosine squared is just a fancy rate of writing one. So this, this parametric equation just has x being one the whole time and y being t. If we were to graph this, well, this would actually be a vertical line at x equals one. It would not end up being uh, a circle here. Can we square these and add them and set equal to one to check as well? Yeah, that's, that's another way of doing it too. Yeah, so... Um, Whenever our circle needs to satisfy is x squared plus y squared. And I don't think it said unit circle. So it just needs to be x squared plus y squared is some number right here. So we just needed to satisfy this equation right here. All right. So that was our first option. So this is not a circle. No. Uh, the next option, x is cosine squared. Y is sine squared. Um, well, let's see. This this also kind of feels like a circle because we have a sine squared, cosine squared uh, pair happening here. Um, but the thing is, is that it doesn't satisfy this equation right here. It turns out that just x plus y equals one for this because x is the cosine squared, y is the sine squared, and when we add those, we get one. So this has the equation x plus y equals one, or y is one minus x. But that is, again, not a circle. It's actually just going to be a line. It's going to look like uh, this right here. OK, so it's not the second option either. Keep going through this. 
Uh, the next one's a little interesting. We have x is secant of t and y equals cosecant of t. All right, now let's see here. Um, now we had other Pythagorean identities um, besides uh, sine squared and cosine squared, um, but secant and cosecant don't form those. So if we had secant squared um, minus one equals tangent squared, that might be different. Or we had cosecant with a cotangent, that could possibly work, but not secant with cosecant. There's no way that that's going to end up looking like this right here. Um, but they have squares, and then doesn't that match the equation? Well, they already have squares when they're only to the first power. So if I did x squared plus y squared, that'd be cosine to the fourth plus sine to the fourth. And that doesn't satisfy the um, Pythagorean identity. All right, the next one, next one's kind of interesting. Oh, yeah, uh, Brittany actually has a good point. Isn't it only in the first quadrant? Yeah, I neglected that. Thank you. Yeah, so since both of these are squared, it would actually only be this part of the line right here, because x and y can only be positive. Yeah, so thanks for pointing that out. All right. So if you had x is secant, y is tangent, that would make a circle. I think you'd have to do more than that, because it's not secant squared plus tangent squared equals 1. It's secant squared is tangent squared plus 1. It would have to be a bit different, but secant and tangent would be more likely to combine that way, though. not just secant and tangent. All right, there's only two more options here. Uh, let's see. We have x is sine of t, and then we have y is sine of t. Okay, now this seems like it'd almost be it, but the thing is, is that we have sine for both of them. We don't have a sine and a cosine. So this is not going to be able to be a circle. In fact, since x and y are the same value, they're always going to be the same thing, this is yet again going to be a line. It's going to be x equals y right here. And since sine can go between negative 1 and 1, it's going to be a line that looks like this. Once again, this is not a circle. All right, so I guess the way my answers were shuffled by process of elimination, the last one has to be a circle, uh, but let's see why that is. So we have x is sine of ln of t, and y is cosine of ln of t. All right, well, let's see here. So we have a sine and a cosine, one for x and one for y, so that's a good start. Now, it doesn't matter which one has the sine or cosine, we just need to have one represented on both sides here. Um, they have the same inside here. And remember, for the Pythagorean theorem to work, sine and cosine need to have the same inside. Okay, so even though it's a weird inside like natural log, it's good that it's the same for each one. And then finally, we need to make sure that they have the same coefficient on the front to guarantee it's a circle and not maybe like an ellipse or something. Uh, but these are technically just one time series. So this actually would be the parameterization of a circle. And like I think uh, I think it was Sam earlier that said, we could also do this by taking a look at this equation here. If we look at x squared plus y squared, that's sine squared of log plus cosine squared of log, and that equals 1. So this satisfies the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1, which is the unit circle right here. All right, so that's why this one actually a, is a circle right here. I have uh, a quick that? question about the first one. I get, you know, um, that x equals cosine of t, y equals sine squared of t. They add up to one, but isn't that what we want in the equation? Well, we want x squared plus y squared to be one. That's going to give us a circle. Oh, my bad. Yeah, this is... Okay, yeah, my bad. I was looking the wrong yeah, way. X, X plus Y equals one. That'll just give us this like diagonal line, but they need to be squared for it to work. All right, so there we go. So even though it's a little bit weird, uh, these end up being our circle components right here. Why are these not going to be it? Because X squared plus Y squared is not one. That, that's, that's probably, honestly, that's probably a better way of doing it rather than seeing you have a sine and cosine on each side, although it does end up being that way. Um, 
Um, just, just see if we have x squared plus y squared equals a number here. Did anyone else just spent? I'm super exhausted. I mean, I'm not a student, but I, I totally feel that way as well. <laughs> this semester has been way too long. Especially without spring break. Still lamenting the loss of spring break. All right. All right, let's question 11. Let's move on to question 12. And for this, I'm going to have to share my internet here. Let's see. Because this one has some pretty pictures to look at. All right. So this question asks, which of the following is the graph of the parametric curve? X is cosine squared and Y is e to the T right here. All right. Oh, for these types of problems, we're just looking for sine and cosine. Yeah, that's mostly it, but you need to make sure that the sine and cosine have the same thing inside. If they don't, that won't necessarily make a circle. All right, now this one kind of seems hard. So there, there's one way we could do this. We could, we could manually draw it out ourselves, um, but this one's kind of a little bit awkward to draw because cosine squared and E are very different functions from each other. So this one, this one's a bit hard to draw. So what we should do instead is we're gonna use process of elimination to get rid of the graphs that won't possibly work. And in order to do that, we're going to play detective and look at the properties of our function. Let's take a look at the x function here. So x is equal to cosine squared. Now cosine squared has a pretty limited range of values it can attain, right? What, what, what's the range of values that cosine squared? That's right, only positive, zero to one. Yes, all those are right. So it seems like our x is confined to be between zero and one. So when we look through these graphs, we need to make sure that um, whatever x value of the graph we pick is always between zero and one. So this first one right here, this kind of squiggly looking one that's tall, um, this is between zero and one. So I guess this could potentially be it. Oh, also, I, I um, yeah, so you, you see my screen flipping around. Uh, I just want to give a warning because I've definitely made this mistake before. Be careful when you use the arrow keys for some of these questions, because I like to use arrow keys to scroll down pages. But if you have an answer highlighted, it'll shift it to the next answer. So all I'm doing is I'm hitting my down arrow and it shifted which answer I have selected. So be sure to click away from the answer box uh, when you're not actually answering the questions. Be sure to check over your exam one more time because it's easy to, to make mistakes like that. All right, anyways. Uh, so we have this between zero and one. Um, this one's also between zero and one, so that seems like it might work. Uh, so is this one. I guess this isn't too much of a clue. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so we can definitely eliminate this graph, right? Uh, because uh, this x value goes as far down as negative one. So there's no way that cosine squared could do that. We can definitely eliminate this graph. There's no way it's going to be doing, it's going to be our graph. And same with this one as well. This one has X values going down to negative one. Uh, so it looks like these bottom two graphs definitely aren't gonna be it, but maybe these, one of these top three will be uh, potential candidates here. All right, so that's what we learned from cosine squared here. Now let's move on to our other function, E to the T. So that also has a limited range of values, right? We can't add our, every number with E to the T. Uh, what's the range of values for y here? That's right. Yeah, it can't be negative, zero to infinity. Yeah, that's right. So it seems like our y needs to be from zero to infinity. So we can't have any negative y's as well. All right, so let's go ahead and scan through. Uh, all right, it seems like we can eliminate this first one because we start to have negative y's right here. Why can't it be negative? Because E is like 2.718, whatever, multiplied by itself a number of times. And there's no way that if you multiply that number by itself, any number of times, you're gonna get a negative one. That's why E to the T is always positive. All right. Um, 
So let's see. Yeah, this one's definitely not going to work anymore. This one could be it because we have positive Ys. Uh, and then this one's definitely not going to work either because um, we have negative ones here. So by process of elimination, that means that this graph right here is our only possible choice. Uh, oh, I just made the mistake that I just warned again. Yeah, so don't use the arrow keys when you have your answer um, highlighted. But yeah, it's going to be this graph right here. It's going to be between um, cosine squared for x and then e to the t for y right here. Yeah, so yeah, Caleb has a good summary of this here. Uh, it's just using knowledge of the graphs and putting together domains and ranges. Yeah, that's that's right. That's that's a good way of thinking. So you're almost like a detective and you need to use the clues to kind of eliminate uh, bogus answer choices. here. How would we judge if one of the equations wasn't bounded? Um, in that case, you might look for how fast it goes towards certain values. So for example, ln of x, that goes to negative infinity really fast. It goes there between t is 0 and 1. So if, if one of your coordinates shoots to negative infinity, that's a sign of a log. Um, so you, you, can, you can use other properties as well. All right. So let's see. So we got that one done. What's the next one on here? I might need to switch back to paper for this. Yep, definitely need to switch back to paper for this right here. All right. Find the second derivative, or d squared y dx squared, for the curve x equals e to the t y equals arc tan of t at t equals zero. All right, let me get my paper up and switch the camera. All right. All right, so we said x was e to the t, y is arc tan of t, and then t is zero. We want to find d squared y dx squared. Okay. So the thing here is that, so this is actually not going to be a formula you'll be provided on your sheet. So we need to, to remember this somehow. And remember, that the, the way I said to remember it was that it's going to be a quotient rule, except that the bottom's cubed and not squared. So remember the dy dx, the first derivative is y prime over x prime, right? Where this is dy dt divided by dx dt. So what we're doing is we're doing the quotient rule on this, except we're going to cube the bottom. All right, so we cube the bottom. So we have x prime cubed. And then we just follow the normal quotient rule. So we bring this up to the top without changing anything. We take the derivative of the top, which will be y double prime. And then we subtract, and then we just flip which ones we did the derivative for. We have x double prime, y prime, right here. All right, so let's go ahead and figure out what all of our derivatives are at t equals 0. And then we could just go ahead and plug stuff in. Well, the nice thing about x is that it's e to the t, the easiest function to differentiate. So x prime is also e to the t. And x double prime is also e to the t. All right, now this one might be a little more complicated. Uh, y prime, uh, do you guys remember the derivative of arc tangent? What's the derivative of arc tangent? One over one plus x squared, that's right. Only this time our variable is t, so we have one over one plus t squared here. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the derivative of this, and let's see here the easiest way to do the derivative of this. I'm going to think of this as 1 plus t squared to the negative 1. And I'm going to do the chain rule and the power rule with this. So I'm going to bring the negative down. And then I have 1 plus t squared to the negative 2. So I did the power rule. And then I multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 2t. So if I simplify this, I have negative 2t over 1 plus t squared squared. All right, so this is, um, this is probably the easiest way of doing it, but you could have also done the quotient rule on 1 over 1 plus t squared. That's, that's also OK. All right, and then now let's plug in t equals 0 for all these. 
So x will be one, x prime will be one, x double prime will be one. Uh, y will be arctan of zero, which is zero. Y prime will be one over one plus zero, which is one. And then this last one will be zero because we have a T up here. All right, so at least the numbers are gonna be easy to plug in. All right, so what does that give us for our second derivative? Well, anything with an X will be a one. So we have one times Y double prime, which is zero, minus X double prime, which is one, times Y prime, which is one, over X prime cubed, which is one. And all in all, we end up with negative one for this right here. All right, so this is going to be our second derivative. Now remember, I'm gonna say this one more time here. The way to remember this is that dy dx is y prime over x prime. So we just do the quotient rule for this, for this fraction here. We just cube the bottom instead of squaring the bottom. All right, so we got that one. And then let's move on to our last problem on this practice exam. This one wants to, us to set up, but not to evaluate an integral representing the circumference of the ellipse. Uh, oh, do you have a uh, question, Christian? Yeah, for the, the second derivative of dy over dx, can I just do d over dt of the first derivative over dx over dt? That's honestly easier for me to remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could do the regular quotient rule and then divide by an additional x prime. Yeah, yeah, you could remember it that way too. Wait, would it be the quotient rule? I thought it was just like the, the, the integral or the derivative of dy divided by the integral of dx. I didn't know you would need to do the quotient rule. No, the, the way we found this formula in class was we did uh, the second derivative of the second derivative is d d t of this divided by dx dt, so by an additional x prime. So we did the quotient rule of this, and then we divided by another x prime. Oh, wait, never mind. I'm doing that anyways. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it, any way you do it, it's going to end up being the same thing. All right, let's go ahead to question 14 here. Our final question on this exam. I, I guess the, the regular exam will be marginally longer than this. Uh, the reason why I cut this down, this used to be 17 questions, but this included stuff with polar coordinates, which I omitted because there won't be anything with polar coordinates on this test. All right. Practice exam 14 right here. All right. So set up a do not evaluate an integral representing the circumference of the ellipse right here. And they give us the parameterization for the ellipse. X is A cosine of T. Y is B sine of T. And they say A and B are constants. So this almost seems like the parameterization of a circle. But the thing is, is that A and B don't need to be the same number. So we may be going further in the X direction than the Y direction, or it's the other way. We could be going further in the Y direction then in the x direction, so we could have an ellipse. All right, so we're trying to find the circumference, right? Circumference. Um, now, I think in class we found the, the, um, the formula for the circumference of a circle. So how did we do that? Do you guys remember how we did that? What, how, how do we find the circumference of a circle? That's right. We use the arc length integral. So our arc length integral is the integral from a to b of the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared dt. All right. So, oh, I guess a and b are kind of bad for this because we already used a and b. I'm going to call them c and d, but these are just the bounds here. All right. So let's try to write this integral for our problem specifically. Now, what, so what range of t values do you think that we're going to go over to get it all the way around the ellipse? That's right. It's going to be 0 to 2 pi. So just like a circle, we have to go through 2 pi worth of angle to get all the way around the ellipse. All right, so we have 0 to 2 pi. 
And then we have the square root. Now let's see, let's do x prime squared. But we only know what x is right now, so let's figure out what x prime is. x prime will be negative a sine of t. And then y prime will be b cosine of t. All right, so then if we square x prime, we're going to have a squared sine squared of t. And if we square y prime, we're going to have b squared cosine squared of t. All right, so there we go. So there is our arc length integral for this. And one easy mistake to make is to just put it, is to keep the sign that we get for our derivative. But don't forget that any signs we get here, remember we're squaring the derivatives. So those are just going to be going away, any signs we have for those. So don't, don't put a negative in there, for example, for this one. Well, the only ask for setup on our exam site, if it's this question, definitely, this is, it may not look like it, this is actually one of those undoable integrals. I have no idea how to do this. Anymore. At least, you know, you get a nice answer. I can do it with a series, but. Yeah, so if it's, a, if it's an integral that you can't do, we're definitely going to. Um, not ideal. Are you going to post the recording right after this? Yeah, I will. Will there be any, um, any m's that we need to find besides the one that we have for like sine of, sine of x? Like sine of x is always pretty much one, or cosine of x is always pretty much one. But other than that, are there any um, m's that we need to know how um, to I, I wouldn't worry about that. If, if there's any more complicated m's, we'll just tell you. Uh, what those are going I I remember on one of the practice exams we had a question where we used uh, the derivative of one over one minus x to determine the sum of a series that wasn't like that wasn't geometric or telescopic. Uh, can you do the same thing with like integration, like where you have a uh, function that needs to be integrated into the form one over one minus x? Um, hmm. I mean, I think we actually did one similar to that um, on the first set of problems here. Um, so last class. Um, let's see, which one was that? Yeah, like number three on the practice exam. So it's x over one minus x squared. So this one, you need to recognize that this looks similar to a derivative of one over one minus x, because we have our bottom squared. So we would find just the series for one over one minus x first, and then take a derivative of that to get it to look like this. That's probably the most similar thing to um, that scenario here. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. So um, well, we need to know the series for ln of one minus x. So you're going to be provided with the series for ln of one plus x. So all you need to do to get the one for ln of one minus x is just substitute a negative in for your x. And it'll give you an extra negative one to the end. So that's how you would get the one for ln of one plus x. Uh, is the formula for the circumference the same for a circle and an ellipse? Well, a, uh, an ellipse doesn't have a well-defined radius. Uh, the circumference for an ellipse is going to be um, what is it? It's going to be pi times a plus b. Is that what it is? Oh, geez. It's been a long time. Well, you don't need to know the circumference of an ellipse for this. <laughs> uh, could I write the ln of 1 minus x thing? Yeah. So the, um, so the formula for ln of 1 plus x is the sum from n equals zero to infinity of, let's see, negative one to the n plus one, x to the n plus one over n plus one, right here. All right. Um, so then if we want to get ln of one minus x, then what we're going to do is we're going to do, we're just going to substitute in a negative in here because this is just going to be um, ln of one plus negative x. 
This will be negative one to the n plus one, negative x to the n plus one, or n right here. Um, actually, wait a minute. This was a negative one to the n. This wasn't, this wasn't n plus one. My mistake. I was thinking of this part. All right. So we have negative x to the n plus one. So we have negative to the n plus one times negative one to the n, and then we have x to the n plus one over n. So this would be our series for ln of one minus x. Now there's actually a way that we could simplify this right here. Oh, what happened to plus one? It should be there. All right, so there's a way we could simplify this. If we use exponent rules, this is negative one to the two n plus one right here. All right, so now negative one to the two n plus one is always going to be what? What's negative one to the two n plus one always gonna be? It's always going to be negative, that's right, because two n plus one is always an odd number. So this is just going to be negative the sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the n plus one over n plus one. This is another way of writing ln of one minus x. Um, so yeah, so if you need to know the series for ln of one minus x, this would be how we would get it right here. All right, looks oddly like e to the x. Yeah, it's just not factorial down there, but other than that. All right, let's see, what other questions do we have here? Let me sip through these, see if we have any Good ones here. Um, da, 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 da. I think someone asked if there was a calculator. Um, there's the basic four function calculator that comes with honor lock, but you can't have your own calculator. Oh yeah, one thing I definitely wanna say, so there is an equation sheet that comes with an exam. It'll, it'll be on the top. You can either just look at it on the top or you could uh, download it. And then I told honor lock, it's okay for you to have a tab open uh, with the equation sheet. But one thing you can't do is you can't print it off and have it with you because it's a bit too hard to verify that it's specifically what we provided you with as opposed to kind of just anything you wrote down or typed up on a piece of paper. So um, yeah, so unfortunately we can't have you guys print it out, but um, it is going to be provided to you on the top of the exam and as a link. All right, um, let's see. What are the questions we have here? Let's see. We go over Kronos 19 question three. Is that the one with square root of X? It's the um, it's the one with the uh, um, Taylor remainder estimate theorem that we they had to use for um, yeah, you, for for the from the previous question. Okay, let's take a look at that. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, because we, yeah, we we have some requests to go over Taylor remainder estimate here. But let me let me just make actually let me just make one up. So I'll I'm, I'll make one up where you actually have to compute the m because that's, that's probably the most difficult scenario is one where we would have to compute the end. So let's say that I want to approximate sine of one using a third degree McLaurin polynomial. Then use the Taylor remainder estimate theorem to get an upper bound on the air. All right, so let's see here. First of all, let's do the approximation here. Let's go over approximating stuff. So we want to use the third degree McLaurin polynomial. So the McLaurin series for sine of x is the sum from n equals zero to infinity 
of negative one to the n, x to the two n plus one divided by two n plus one here. So this is going to be uh, sine of x here. All right, now, rather than using the entire series, oh, factorial, thank you. Now, rather than using the entire series here, we're instead only gonna go up to the third degree. Now, remember, degree means exactly the same thing that it does for polynomials, which is just the highest power of x. All right, so we're gonna keep plugging in n's until we get an x cubed in here. So I put in zero, I have negative one to the zero is one, I have x to the zero plus one is x, and then I have one factorial is one. So I just get x for this. Then I plug in my next term, n equals one. So when I put that in here, I have negative x cubed over three factorial right here. This ends up being negative x cubed over three factorial. And that's where we're going to stop because now we have a third degree polynomial that we're going to approximate sine with. All right, so there's sine of x. Sine of x is approximately equal to x minus x cubed over three factorial. So this means that if I wanna figure out what sine of one is, that's gonna be approximately equal to one minus one over three factorial, one minus one sixth, AKA five sixth. So the approximation isn't too hard. The approximation is just going to be five sixths. Or sine of one. All right. Now we want to figure out a maximum upper bound on the air. Now this is an alternating series, so um, they could also have asked you to use the alternating series error estimate theorem, um, but they specifically asked you to use the Taylor one here. All right. So what is this? So this says that the error is going to be less than or equal to m times x minus a to the n plus one over n plus one factorial. Now remember what, let's, let's try to remember what each of these mean. So x is the number we plugged in. So in this case, it's gonna be one. That's the x value we used. A is the center of our series and it's a Maclaurin series, so it's gonna be zero. N is the degree of the approximation and the degree of the approximation here was three. So n will be three. Now m is, is the hardest one to get here. So let's think about what m is. So m has to be greater than or equal to the absolute value of the n plus first derivative of our function with this mysterious number c plugged in. Now let's, let's define what c is. c is in between x and a. So in this case, we're going to have zero is less than or equal to c is less than or equal to one. So c can be any number in between zero to one. Now, no matter what number we pick for c, no matter what number we pick between zero and one, we need to make sure that m is bigger than the n plus first derivative at that number. Now, we know what n is for our problem. n is going to be four. So this is going to be the fourth derivative of c right here. So m is greater than the fourth derivative of sine some value. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly it. All right. So let's compute four derivatives of sine. Okay. Well, with sine, it's not too hard. Um, so our first, our zeroth derivative is sine. Then we do one and get cosine. We do another and get negative sine. We do a third and get negative cosine. And then when we do a fourth right here, let's just do this. Then we have, we actually swing back to just being sine of x. All right. So m is going to be greater than or equal to the absolute value of sine of c, where c is in between zero and one right here. Now, the nice thing about sine is that the absolute value sine for any input, so we didn't really even know, need to know too much about the C. For any input, we know absolute value of sine is less than or equal to one. So that could be our M 
for this problem. M of one is a nice number to use here because sine of anything, including anything in this range, will have an absolute value less than one. All right, so we know what all of our ingredients are. We know X is one, A is zero, N is three, and M is one. So now we know, know everything we need to know to compute our error here. So we have M is one. So we have one times the absolute value of one minus zero to the fourth divided by four factorial. Um, so all this is one. So this ends up being one over 24. So with this approximation of five sixths, we know that's gonna be within one over 24 of the, like within that much of the true value of sine of one. So we can't be any further away from the true value than this one is. I'm assuming we won't have 2021 for end on this type of problem, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit hard to do um, 2021 factorial, for example. So yeah, don't worry about it. How is m equal to one if it's sine of one? Well, this is a greater than or equal to sine right here. So it just needs to be greater than or equal to sine of c. And if we pick it to be one, then that will do the job. Will this formula be on a sheet? This, uh, this information will be provided to you. So this, this stuff, oh, and also that it's bigger than this. Uh, all, all of this will be provided. If f of x is sine, can we always make m equal one? Um, well, there are ways it could be different. So maybe, for example, instead of using sine of x, maybe I use like f of x is sine of 3x. So maybe if my function was f of x is sine of 3x right here, then if I did four derivatives of this, I would end up having three to the fourth times sine of three X. Cause we saw that going through four derivatives brings you back to sine, but we have to multiply by a three every time. So for this one, our M would probably be three to the fourth because we know absolute value of sine is gonna be less than one, but then we have this extra three to the fourth there as well. So this might be something to watch out for. I guess we could expect you to find M in that case. Um, but yeah, the, the gold rule here is that absolute value of sine or cosine of anything is gonna be less than one. That's what we're going to use. All right, let's see here. Um, we could need to solve the 2021st derivative. I mean, you could maybe need to do that for like one of those power series problems, but I don't think it would be for something like this. I'm not gonna ask you to do a 2021 degree approximation for something. Can exec the exam be easier than the practice exam? Um, I think for this one, I think some topics will be easier. I think some might be a bit trickier. I, I think it'll be about a wash, although I don't know. A lot of times I'm not a good judge of these things, but I, I think it'll be about the same as the practice exam, if I had to guess. All right. Um, looks like we're just about out of time. Maybe I can find one super quick question here. Um, let's see. See, can I take the exam for me? Yeah, sorry. Um, how do you convert from circle parametric equations? With circles, we want either x or y to be sine and then the other one to be cosine. The number in front of those is the radius. And then the number added to those is the center right here. But what, how do you work with that um, when there's, say, something pass into sine or cosine? Like oh, when, when there's like something change. on the inside of it? Mm -hmm. um, that, that means it's just going to spin through the circle at a different speed rather than just 2 pi. It's still going to draw the circle. Oh, OK, thank you. Yeah. All right. So anyways, that's, that's about all the time we have here. Um, if you send me an email, I might be able to get to it uh, before the exam this evening. Um, uh, but yeah, that's about it. So I wish you guys best of luck. And then on Wednesday, we're going to start our final topic of the semester, which is going to be floor courses. All right, now some people wanted to see my cats. So let's see if, um, let's see if they're around. Professor, what do you